Let's get started with the lab. So here is the lab assignment for today. So in this lab, you are going to understand various protocols that operate at the network layer. So you will look at how IP fragmentation works. You will also look at the DHCP protocol and ICMP protocol. So let's see uh, what the exercises are. So the first exercise is on IP fragmentation. I mean if you have covered the concepts, you will know that. Uh, so what happens is this is your host and you are sending some packets over multiple hops. So these are this intermediate routers, let me call them R1, R2, R3. Finally there is another host at the end point. So this is the path the packets are going to take. Now the MTU size which is the maximum transmission unit that can be carried on a link can vary from link to link. Ethernet has a size of 1500 but there may be other technologies in between that may have different size. For example if you are using a PPP link for in the middle you can have a size of only 512. So whenever you send a packet that exceeds the size of the underlying maximum transmission unit size, you have to break up the packet that is IP fragmentation. Uh, I will not get into too much detail, you can look into the slides to understand how IP fragmentation is done. So this exercise is going to show you a demonstration of what is happening to the IP headers when the packet gets fragmented. So what you are going to do as part of this uh, exercise is you will first we have provided some scripts called send UDP I think um, I will so I think it is send UDP but does not matter the name. So this is a script this is a code that has been provided for you what this code does is it is going to send a packet of the specified size. So what you are going to use is use this program to send packets that exceed 1500. So you should definitely send a large packet that is greater than 1500, let us say 4000. And you could also try sending a packet that is under 1500, let us say 500. And in each case you can see what is happening when the packet goes out. So in your particular case your host is connected over ethernet which has an MTU size of 1500. So what you are doing is at the um, protocol uh, the socket programming level you are generating a large packet of size 4000. So this means that your network level which is the IP layer is going to fragment this particular packet and create multiple fragments. Whereas in this particular case where you are sending only 500 bytes it has no reason to fragment so it will just send it out. So when you are using the send UDP dot C you have to specify uh, I mean I will let you figure out how to use the code uh, it is kind of rather straightforward. So use this code to generate a packet and send it out and experiment with different packet sizes and just like before you first have to run TCP dump with the right filters then you use the send UDP program to send the required packets and then you are going to stop TCP dump and analyze your trace through Wireshark. Where when you are analyzing the trace to Wireshark you will look at the IP headers to see how the packet has been fragmented. So that is part of exercise 1. So when you are using this IP fragmentation a point to note is uh, this is a send UDP dot C it will generate a single IP packet of a given size and it is going to send it to a specific destination IP address. 
which destination IP address you should use, try both an existing host and a non-existing host and see what happens. That is something for you to figure out. Okay. The next exercise is on DHCP, which is basically this dynamic host configuration protocol. This protocol is used to obtain an IP address. Apart from obtaining an IP address, often you get additional information such as who the DNS server is, who your next hop router is, so on and so forth. So normally in order to run DHCP, you need root permissions since you may not have root permissions on your machines. If you have, you can by all means go ahead uh, run this particular, uh, so basically all you need to do in case you have root permissions is in a terminal, you have to type uh, DHCP and the Ethernet, uh, the interface information E0. Yeah, what you need to type is DH client, not DHCP, because that is the program that is going to execute the DHCP protocol. So just type DH client E0 on any terminal with root permission. Um, so you run TCP dump, in a terminal you run DH client E0 and then close the TCP dump, open it Wireshark, you will see a trace. But if you do not have root permissions, that is also fine. I have provided you a trace within that Google Drive. In fact, uh, your coordinator will also provide you that information. All you need to do is evaluate that particular trace that I have uh, provided and in the process understand how DHCP works and answer these following questions. Exercise 3 is about this protocol called ICMP, uh, it stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. So the objective of ICMP is to provide some kind of feedback at the network layer. So the routers, whenever they are unable to do a task, for example, if they are dropping a packet, mostly they have no obligation to tell you that they have dropped a packet, but sometimes they do tell. Uh, similarly, end hosts also, if you are sending a packet uh, to a port where no one is listening at the end host, the end host often sends a packet saying no one is listening on this particular port. Uh, routers for example could tell that there is no such destination at the other end, but that is totally up to the router to tell. Some routers do not reply back uh, based on ICMP, some routers do. So the fact that you did not get a reply uh, means you do not have much feedback on what is happening. So this exercise 3 is about generating different type of ICMP. Uh, types, type 0, code 0, type 3, code 3, type 8, code 0. If you are not clear what it is, I would ask that you look at the ICMP slides to understand what this type and code is. You can also Google to learn a little bit more about the ICMP protocol. So basically in this exercise, you need to figure out what do this type code refer to and accordingly use that particular tool to generate ICMP packets corresponding to this particular type. So in the last exercise which is exercise 4, we are going to make use of this very special tool called trace route. Uh, you are free to use either trace route or trace path, whatever is installed on your system both uh, work uh, in a similar fashion. So I do not know what your workshop coordinators have installed, but they should install one of either trace route or trace path. Trace route is slightly better uh, than trace path, but it really does not matter. So what you are going to use is use this uh, tool trace route or trace path that relies underneath on ICMP to determine what is the path your packet is sending. So for example, packet is taking. For example, if you were to uh, say trace root www. let us say google.com, um, from your host it is going to take many hops via some intermediate routers. So what trace root will tell you is the name of these intermediate routers, how much time it took for the packet to go from you to that intermediate router and also at what hops, how many hops did your packet take. So across every hop, so first hop this is the router, second hop this is the router, third hop this is the router. So it is going to give this particular information. So you can experiment uh, using trace route to find out the paths to different hosts. 
So when you are doing it, ensure that you are always selecting a host that is not on the same physical LAN. If you for example do that, it will just be a hop count of 1 which is not giving much information. So ask your workshop coordinator to provide you a name of a machine that is many hops away from your particular host. Um, by the way, there are also some trace route utilities available on the internet, just do a Google it will uh, provide you a command where you can type trace route to whatever destination and it will do for you. Um, so for example, this is a tool that is available online, there are in fact many such uh, tools, I just googled quickly and I found this. So for example, let us try something else, www dot uh, redif dot com. Okay. So if you do it is processing this information, so as you can see from wherever this particular uh, server is located, it is kind of figuring out where all it is going, so it is starting from here, it reads some juniper whose IP address is here, then it reads some core 21 dot Herzner, so it, this is something located far away. So it is kind of trying to figure out what is the route from wherever the server is located, looks like it is located in some country, other not in India, so it is going through some, uh, so it is going to give you the name of the intermediate routers, how much time it takes to reach this particular routers. Something that you may notice is this thing where it kind of hangs, it does not give any additional information. That is because the other routers are not responding to, or in other words they are not getting back to you with the ICMP uh, replies, that is why you cannot find out what that information is. There are many such tools, you could use any of the tools to kind of figure out the trace route. So more or less that is the lab for today and I am open to taking questions about the lab. We will do this for the next uh, half an hour, after that we will do some concept based questions. Actually Madam as far as uh, Gratitude Sharp is concerned, hmm. so at uh, who invokes this uh, Gratitude Sharp and at what point of time exactly it is being invoked? Okay. Okay. So Gratitude Sharp, um, as I said, what you have used is a tool that, you, that they have given at the user level to run. But typically gratuitous ARP is incorporated as part of the kernel, often whenever you change your IP address, uh, it is automatically triggered internally within the kernel to send a gratuitous ARP. But by the way that is again it, if you uh, do a TCP dump and see I changed my IP address and I do not see a gratuitous ARP, that is very implementation specific. Certain implementations implement, certain may not do it, so typically it is a feature that comes about when you are changing your uh, IP address or your MAC address for that matter. Okay, one more question, hmm. so that is uh, inside the etc host configuration file, so there are basically two entries I found, one is for loopback address that is 127.0.0.1 having the local host as the uh, host name. And one more entry that is 127.0.1.1 yeah. having the corresponding host name. And whenever we are specifying the host name command, so it is giving us that particular host name as the name of the host of the machine. Okay. Exactly what this 127.0.1.1 signifies because there is no interface being assigned with this particular address. Yeah. So typically in a given machine, you have something called local host IP address that is what corresponds to 127.0.0.1. This address is useful especially in fact when you do socket programming exercise which is coming on the last, the sorry not on Friday, this address is very useful. So for example, you are writing some sockets, you are writing some server, you want to write some client. In a typical setting maybe your server is running somewhere, your client is running server somewhere, but as a programmer you want to test the functionality. So what you do is you run both the server and the client on your own machine. 
where but typically the server client work with IP addresses and because they are running on the same machine you will use this uh, local host IP address to achieve that. So basically this is the uh, same address that is going uh, so each local host is assigned this IP address so that you can use it for your uh, socket programming kind of a thing. So apart from an IP address which is external where everyone else can use it internally if you want to communicate between processes using sockets this address is very useful. about the 127.0.1.1 ha huh? what so what, what this the? signifies 127.0.1.1 okay that uh, is being assigned as the host name what has it been assigned as host name if you give the host name command so yeah. that particular name is going to be given for you um, 127.0 yeah, so anything in this space is all related to this local host loopback thing itself. I have to kind of dig in once on uh, uh, yeah, I think that is related to IPv6. I mean I, I really have to I mean in, uh, I vaguely remember it, but I actually have to dig in a little bit more to answer that particular question. So, with the use of IPv6 certain things have emerged that uh, you want to create uh, what is it called an IP address that uh, IPv6 has more sophisticated features where you do not even need an IP address, but you can communicate within a particular local area network without an IP address some kind of a thing. So, this may be related to it, but as I said I really need to uh, uh, look it up in order to answer that question. So, let me I mean I will get back to this question. Good morning ma'am. Hmm. Um, actually there was some problem in running ARP script command huh. and I tried to install it by sudo apt get install ARP command. Are you talking After about install install it? ARPing? ARPing. Huh. ARPing. I had mentioned this earlier also if you use R, if the kernel already has R ping and you try to install it again your network interface card will not work. So, do not install it it is already there as part of the kernel. Oh, okay ma'am. Huh. Thank you ma'am. Good morning ma'am. Tell me. Uh, ma'am uh, in lab session while we are trying with SSH session in TCP dump mm -hmm. uh, as per your instruction we tried with uh, two different terminals mm -hmm. but this TCP dump is not capturing the uh, packets from uh, two different terminals and we googled for this SSH and uh, put it in a single command line both SSH and TCP dump even then it is not capturing and uh, the capture file uh, shows zero bytes of data. So, what would be the potential problem or uh, where would have uh, went wrong? So, as I said something you have done wrong because TCP dump will capture whatever is going out of your interface it is independent of how many ever terminals you open. Um, maybe you did not give a right filter uh, at the TCP level uh, I mean unless I actually know the sequence of steps you followed it is not easy to debug. You can take the help of the TAs in the afternoon to debug it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, when I am running one program, one client program and one server program using socket programming, TCP socket programming, we are, I am running both the programs in a single host. We are uh, tracing in the background using TCP dump of what are the packet transmission you are happening between them. So, TCP dump. Uh, I mean offhand I do not know maybe I would not be surprised if TCP dump does not capture those packets because they are going through the loop back it is not quite going out of the host. TCP dump typically captures packets that are going out as well as coming in through whatever interface you are specifying since these packets never leave the machine you may not be able to capture it, but it is possible to change the setting like in other words that minus i interface if you were to give the loopback interface then you should be able to capture that. Okay. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. There is another question. Hello. Huh. Yeah. Uh, whenever I am going for a filter in Wireshark for IP6, so most of the packet that is coming with the protocol MDNS. In? It's a multiple DNS service. MDNS, multiple DNS. Mm. Showing it is a protocol. But uh, can can we mention MDNS as a protocol? Because it is a service so far in my knowledge. Why it is shown in the protocol in the Wireshark if I filter it for IP6 packets only? MMDNS protocol. Can you spell it? Is it is multicast domain name service. Oh, MDNS. It is showing if I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It huh. is multicast DNS that is showing. Huh. But no. if I filter it for IP6 packets only through Wireshark. Huh. But can we declare MDNS as a protocol? No, no. So, it, so that is again something very internal to Wireshark. If, for example, as part of it some IPv6 header was used, it may uh, show it as part of, because it happened to use an IPv6 header uh, or internally there is an IPv6 address as part of uh, uh, the DNS resolution, it may show. While doing this gratuitous ARP, how many number of nodes uh, this uh, particular node is sending this uh, ARP in a, in a subnet or beyond the subnet all? Anything that is related to broadcast is contained within the subnet. It will not go outside your... O only in the subnet? In fact, I will be more, in fact that is also a little bit loose. Anything your broadcasting will be contained within your local area network. It could be an extended local area network, but it is all, whatever you define it, as a link layer network. It won't go. Typically the subnets, you could have multiple subnets on the same uh, physical network in which case it can reach my other subnets, but typically that is not the case. So it, it does not go beyond, uh, if all switches are interconnected, it will be contained within all these interconnections. Whenever it hits a router, it stops at the router. Hello. Ha, I can hear Good you. Good morning ma'am. Question is about network simulator. Huh. Uh, at present time, we use the many of uh, simulator. <coughs> Which one is best simulator in uh, mobility? Just like as uh, Glomo Sim, NS2, GNS3, or Quellnet. Okay. See, I mean, I have no experience with using any other simulator other than NS2. Uh, so I really cannot compare. Most of the research community tends to use NS2 because it is open source and you often we would like to write our own modules as part of the simulator because we are doing research there is nothing that is out there we need to write our own protocols. So for which NS2 is very conducive. Some of these uh, proprietary things do not let you access uh, the internals that easily. Uh, from a teaching perspective when you are trying to do maybe some of these other simulators are better because they come with nice graphical user interface uh, with lot of features for teaching. Uh, but uh, since we use NS2 for research, we use it for teaching also. So I do not have an answer. Typically in any of the research papers, we typically see NS2 and not these other simulators. But they do appear once in a while, but that is not common. Yes. Good morning ma'am. Uh, in TCP Dumbo or Wireshark, uh, can we directly interface through some programming language and we can directly access the data? So TCP Dump is basically collecting data into a file and once things are in the file, you can use any scripting language um, or whatever other programs you want to evaluate the data to mine it in whatever fashion you want. That is totally uh, available. So you uh, are right, you, you are running TCP dump, collecting the logs, and then you can run scripts over the logs to extract whatever information you want. Yes, that is very much feasible. Thank you. One more question, ma'am. Hmm. Namshaya, this is uh, like this is regarding uh, today's lab, like the IP fragmentation. Okay. So when we, uh, like I am the TA of this uh, workshop, like when we are doing the lab, we had given the total data as like 4000, 
okay and then we got the first fragment as like we are in the 100 mbps subnet okay and then we got the first fragment as one uh, fra first fragment contains 1480 bytes of data and then like second fragment contained uh, thous another 1480 bytes of data and the next uh, in the third fragment it showed us like uh, the remaining is uh, uh, totally it made a count of 4008 instead of giving 4000 so we would like to know what is that 8 bytes which the ip fragment uh, added on the data okay um, <laughs> well i mean it's like giving away the solution uh, i'll give you a hint i won't give the solution because uh, people others also need to figure this information out the name of so you figure out it's a header of some kind that is also being counted. So you figure out what this header is and you can also look a little bit at the code. Uh, you don't really need to know socket programming in a detail, but uh, it's kind of self-explanatory. If you look at the code, you understand what is happening. So there is some headers that are getting added. So you kind of uh, look into it to figure out where the date is coming from. The name of the program also should give you a hint. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Huh. Uh, I've been working with the ARP. I don't have any issues with the ARP, but working with the Grises ARP, while using a ARP with the request and re uh, reply, while reply, I found out the answer was our target MAC address. While using request, uh, I don't find any uh, thing like a uh, MAC address or something. I can differentiate how does the, uh, uh, the request and uh, Reply actually work with your Grace's ARP? See, um, I don't. So, one thing which I have seen when people do this ARP exercise is getting confused with the link layer header and the ARP payload. So, if you see this, ARP packets themselves will have an Ethernet header attached to it. And within the Ethernet header, there will be a destination and a source MAC address. Okay, so that is one aspect and within the ARP content itself which is the payload of that uh, Ethernet packet also there is a source and destination address as part of that payload. You have to be clear what is it that you are talking about. So a reply or a request uh, ARP is broadcast so no matter what you see you will see at the MAC level the uh, Ethernet header the destination will be broadcast. But if you were to look within the content of the ARP packet itself, which is talking about what the destination MAC, source MAC is, things may be different based on whether it is a request or a reply. And that said, it is also heavily implementation dependent. You could for all practical purpose repeat the same uh, IP address and the MAC combination in both the source and the destination because you are generating that particular packet you could put it in both the fields within the ARP packet or you could put it in the source ignore the uh, uh, destination depending upon whether it is request reply so that is a very much an implementation artifact so in different implementations may fill that data differently what matters is the fact that the MAC header destination is broadcast and within the ARP packet the source IP and the source MAC will correspond to your own MAC and the target can be anything else. It's, it's all right if you don't fill it properly. Is that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you, madam. My, my question is regarding to the use of uh, Wireshark tool, ma'am. Yeah, first question, how can I capture other computers packets on the same network, ma'am? So as I, I mean I mentioned this earlier also in order to capture other packets not any packet that comes to your own machine whether be it broadcast or unicast you can capture. But if you want to capture other people's packet I had mentioned this earlier you need support from the hardware as well as your driver not all drivers hardware support it you should basically put your card in what is called promiscuous mode then you should be able to capture it. But as I said, it is very much dependent on the uh, card that you have and the driver that you have. Yeah, second question. Yeah, that is how to capture packets using Wireshack in a switched, uh, switched Ethernet network. Yes, 
I think the concept, I mean there is no difference, anything so switched, uh, whenever you use switched ethernet, um, more often than not you will not see other people's packets because the switch if it is clever, it would have learnt that they are not directed towards your port. So, it will not pass those packets on your interface, so it is not possible for you to capture. Only whatever switch designs to pass to your host, you can capture. So, that is one of the advantages of switching, it hides a broadcast of course, if it is being broadcast you will get, but if it is uh, some neighbor transmitting some unicast packet to some other neighbor, uh, you will not be able to uh, listen in on that conversation. Good afternoon ma'am. Huh. Ma'am my question is related to SSH, SSH protocol. Yesterday when I am uh, working on SSH protocol and I am giving this, uh, I was giving this command, but it uh, always asks for password, root password. Root password. So, when, uh, when I give this password, yes, when I give this root password, it did not take. So, what password uh, uh, I am, I will give uh, host or host 2 password. Okay. See, typically when you are SSHing into the other machine, you have to specify what your username is. So, for example, you will do SSH. You have to for example, if I am um, logging in to, into my machine uh, whose username is Chebrolu, I will do SSH Chebrolu at IP address of my machine. So, where if you do not specify the username, it typically gives uh, it as a root. So, it is often a good practice to specify who are you. So, it typically it will be SSH username at the IP address or the host name. So, once you uh, type it in, it will ask for a password and the password should be of the not your local machine password, it should be the password of the machine into which you are SSHing into. Um, I Corresponding that to that particular I user. Name. Yes ma'am, I uh, specify the username, then IP address and I give the password also, but it is not a accepting that password. Then I mean something wrong with uh, maybe that password is incorrect. Again this question I would say uh, bring it up with the in the afternoon session with the TA because it needs more detail. Uh, I do not want to get into the detail uh, during this session. Uh, please contact I mean I will also be available. So, uh, bring it up in the afternoon during the chat session. A can we make a team for heterogeneous subnet is maintaining under the same gateway? See R, when you use R ping, you basically what it does is it generates an R packet where the content of the R packet is you will specify your uh, IP address and MAC address combination and send it out as a broadcast. So, this packet will reach all the machines that are part of that particular physical uh, local area uh, network. Typically that is often the same subnet. So, they will not go beyond your subnet. Ma'am in the same LAN, huh. suppose in our, in our college uh, local area network, hmm. there are we maintaining different subnets, okay. different subnets for the different so, my question is whether we can uh, I mean apply ARP to generate various ARP or not. I mean you so that is my question. What do you mean apply? If you apply it apart from your own subnet, it may go to other subnet also, but uh, often uh, they may not have any need for it because their router as soon as it detects that this is not part of the same subnet, it will uh, contact the router. So, it is the case that when you generate this, it will go to uh, uh, other hosts belonging to other subnet because they are part of the same physical LAN. But that information is useless for them because they are not part of the same subnet because uh, the machine will contact uh, the router rather than. Uh, so, it is just discarded or it can even be cached, but it would not be used. <coughs> well, I have another question. If our college have LAN and WAN, oh sorry, LAN and the WLAN both, yes. so at the same time can we? Gracious, 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 gracious,
see if you are switching them both for example you connect the lan and your wireless lan via a layer 2 switch then whatever you send uh, in your uh, physical the ethernet uh, side of it uh, will go to the wireless side of it also that means they are both in the same extended lan setup so it's a broadcast it will go everywhere uh, hi ma'am yesterday uh, in the exercise 2 when we were supposed to send ARP packets within the subnet to a host which is reachable, uh, it was mentioned that uh, there should be uh, four uh, ARP packets needs to be exchanged uh, in the uh, list when we trace it. But we were uh, we just got two. Uh, so could you just tell us why it should be four? So again, I mean, I won't be surprised if it is a different number because again, it's a function of uh, the implementation and uh, so on and so forth. Typically, whenever you're trying to reach, um, well, let me say there are multiple factors at play here. So if you have used ping to uh, reach this non-existent host and you did not use minus C option there, in other words, you just ran ping, the address and then you are running TCP dump to capture. The very first packet of ping you try to resolve its uh, uh, MAC address and uh, you try you send the first ARP no reply has come. So ARP is going to time out and again it will try then again no reply. So there is a typical number which is I do not know whether it is 3 or 4 whatever it is it will try those many number of times and it will time out. But then what happens is then the second ping packet that you have sent is waiting in the buffer, right. Then it will look at the second ping packet, look at the IP address and again it is because it, it does not have it in the cache because there is no MAC corresponding to it, it will again initiate another ARP for that. So if you see this, you may see 10, 20 or even 50 ARP uh, packets going asking for what is the MAC address corresponding to this particular IP address. Uh, so the way if you really want to know the ARP timeout in other words how many times does it try before giving it up you should use ping minus C1 which is basically telling ping only with one packet. Then you will see how many times ARP tries with a, before giving up that number I do not know whether it is 3 or 4 but that is the correct answer. Ma'am that would be for a, a host which is not reachable right this will be for a host that is not reachable yes yeah but i was asking for a host that's reachable for a host that is reachable what happened you are saying you saw four so during periodically uh, uh, as you are sending packets whatever is in the cache at sometimes gets cleared out in which case it will can send arp again if it is an extended ping which is you are doing for a again it is a configuration parameter for some the cache entries are stored for a long duration for some they are stored only for a few seconds. So each time it gets cleared out it will send additional ARP. So it is a function of what this value is set to. Thank you. In Wireshark while capturing a frame uh, we have come across the checksum field in network and transport level. Uh, is it possible for us to capture packets in which the checksum is not correct? And I would also like to know that this error control that we have learned at Ethernet, but we do not see these fields when we see that uh, space in Wireshark. Uh, That's all, my question is over. The second portion I did not understand. So let me answer the first portion, then maybe you can ask the second portion. Um, in order for you to capture packets where the checksum has failed, uh, so naturally when you are sending out the packets uh, you have just calculated the checksum so there is no scope for it failing. But if you are receiving packets from somewhere else uh, it is possible for the checksum to fail but that is a function of the underlying fiber what errors has it introduced so on so forth. Typically over a fiber it is not easy for you to uh, um, what is it called see that kind of uh, losses uh, corruption where you can actually capture where the bits are corrupted. With wireless it may be slightly better but even there also the chances of you capturing a packet where the checksum has failed 
is very difficult. So, in reality capturing such packets is not an easy task. It does not show in the Wireshark trace. It does not I mean it does it does tell you whether the checksum has passed or not. So, when you click on it it does show you the CRC checksum. Uh, my second question is in Mac layer also we have error control, but when we open that trace for the ethernet we do not see any checksum or error control. So, only field that we see very true, but that is definitely not from destination source and type. Yeah, it is uh, conceivable that see normally the checksum when you are sending uh, a packet out, the checksum field is appended at the tail and often the checksum calculation of checking whether this packet has been received correctly or not is implemented in hardware, not in software. So, you do that calculation if it has failed you just dump the packet it does not even come to the driver level. So, Wireshark or TCP dump can only capture those packets that are at the software level uh, only then you will it will make a copy. If this packet is being dropped uh, at that uh, hardware level itself and mostly the CRC implementations are in hardware uh, you will not see it. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, actually it is regarding the lab one, uh, there was one question about DNS and we were supposed to get the DNS IP address from uh, result on con file, hmm. but uh, at our place it was having the local address that is 127.0.0.1. So, I just want to clarify whether it is required to have the DNS entry over there or uh, does it fetch it from the gateway router or how exactly then work out when actual DNS IP is not there in the result.com. Okay. So, it looks like you have a more latest version of Ubuntu definitely I think is what Ubuntu 14.04 do you know? Maybe we need to get back and check that. Huh. So, the, the earlier versions of Ubuntu had uh, DNS implemented via the DNS server where the uh, IP address of the DNS uh, is or even the host name is stored in the slash etcetera resolve.com. In the later versions of Ubuntu I do not know from where definitely 14.04 uh, implements it where the local machine itself implements a DNS service. So, when you are uh, making a query your, your DNS server is running within your own host and it is replying that is why it shows you as a local host uh, address which is the 127.0.0.1 address. Uh, what your internal DNS server is doing is it is con is contacting the other. So, it, it does lot of caching. So, it will serve locally based on the cache, but if it is not there in the cache it will contact your departments uh, DNS server, but this information is not easy to access because the. So, whenever you do DHCP whatever information you get this local DNS server gets that information and stores it, but you as such that etcetera resolve.conf is no more valid for later versions of Ubuntu. And maybe because of the same reason we did not get the host name I mean it was not there in the host file as well. So, yeah. whenever we used to get try to get host of DNS uh, it was giving error. Uh, yeah, so because it as because I said it will give you local host if you try to because that is one who is serving your DNS request. Ok, yeah. ok thank you. So, we will now move on to some concept uh, clarification. Okay, this question is from uh, remote center 1263. So, what was asked is the first question is what is a backlogged host? So, backlogged host often means that this is a host that has lot of traffic to send, uh, the buffer is uh, full, where it always has a packet to send if given an opportunity. So, that is what the definition of a backlogged host is. Um, what the second question that was asked there is why are the number of repeaters or hubs limited in a ethernet uh, LAN? Instead why do not we connect many repeaters such that we can make a link of larger length by avoiding attenuation. So, this question it is an interesting question. So, what happens typically is each 
uh, for example, again I am talking off my head, these things may not quite be true. Uh, so, Ethernet has multiple standards 10 base 5, uh, 100 base 5 so on so forth. For each of the standard there is a limit on the number of repeaters you can have. For example, for the 10 Mbps Ethernet the limit is 4 repeaters and I think the separation is about 500 meters between them leading to an overall length of 2500 meters. By the way, I am just uh, telling this off my head, uh, but I, I would think this is correct, but um, anyway the concept does not rely on uh, the numbers. So, the reason the question is why should we restrict ourselves to 4 repeaters, if we had used many more repeaters we could extend the length all the way to 10,000 meters on so on so forth. I covered this again as part of the concept, there is a limit in ethernet on the frame size which is a function of the propagation delay which is the two way propagation delay. Let me call it 2 times T p. Now the reason why this relation holds is because this is what will facilitate collision detection properly. In other words you should continue to transmit bits till you get a feedback in the form of. So, the first bit went and you got a feedback in the form of twice the propagation delay you should not stop uh, before this. So, now what happens is if you were to extend this length what is going to happen is this value is going to become very large. Now, if this value becomes very large your frame size which is the minimum frame size also has to be large, because you have to continue to transmit during that time. Now, if you say insist that ethernet use a frame size of let us say 3000 uh, uh, bytes or whatever bytes it is, then if you have smaller size packets to send you unnecessarily have to pad them. So, this is unnecessary wastage of resources. So, you want the frame size to be, uh, so there is a trade off here you do not want too big a frame size. Uh, because then there is a lot of uh, redundant padding information you have to send. And if you go with very small frame size then you cannot support uh, lo uh, longer ethernet uh, segments. In other words you will be restricted to a few uh, 100 meters or uh, uh, 1000 meters and so on so forth. So, this frame size that currently ethernet use is a compromise between um, the length you want to achieve versus uh, so, for 2500 meters this frame size is about 512 bytes, so that is a compromise that people have worked on. Okay. The second question uh, many people have asked in fact this has come from multiple remote centers uh, variants of this is why do we need error detection and correction uh, at the link layer when the transport layer also does it. Uh, in fact, network layer also does some kind of error detection. So, what is uh, when do you do error correction, when do you do error detection, uh, at what layer should you be doing it. So, there are these uh, aspects of uh, things related to it. So, let me explain what is happening here. So, which layer should you do error detection. So, let us first just focus on error detection for now, let us get to error correction later. So, where should you do error detection, should you do at the link layer, should you do at the network layer, should you do at the transport layer. Now, there is a principle called uh, end to end arguments that is used uh, extensively. I mean if you do any of these research side papers there is a famous paper called end to end arguments in it, uh, internet design. So, when people were originally designing internet of course, they had to answer some of these questions. If you look at a functionality where exactly should we implement this functionality, which layer should we implement this functionality. Certain things like this error detection can be applicable at multiple layers. Another such functionality could be duplicate packet suppression. You can see duplicates at the link layer, you can see duplicates at the network layer you can see duplicates at the transport layer, application layer so on so forth. So, where should one suppress duplicates. So, there are many such functionalities and it is a question of where should one apply this particular functionality. So, what the end to end argument suggests is that you should apply this functionality 
at the highest layer possible by which I mean application layer. But in reality things are slightly different I will uh, get to that why is it that you should apply at the highest layer it is because things can go wrong. So, for example, let us say you decide that I will apply error detection only at the link layer. So, fine when you send a pa packet from one node to the neighbor that is where link layer operates you were able to detect some errors and you were able to drop that packet or take some corrective action because of it. But what if your network layer corrupted the bits. Uh, for example, the IP protocol all of these involve reading from some memory writing into some memory when you are reading into the memory or writing into the memory let us say you corrupted some bits. Now, who is going to capture this errors? Similarly, if you say fine then I will implement something at the network layer then the same logic applies at the transport layer. What if some corruption happened at the transport layer? So, if things can go wrong at any of the bottom layers the best way to handle it is to subsume all this and handle it at the highest layer possible which in this case turns out to be the application layer because then you can kind of uh, take care of all the errors that are happening at the link layer or the network layer or the transport layer. But what happens in reality is that certain times there is a trade off. Uh, if you do everything at the application layer efficiency is going to take a hit. So, for example, uh, if you look at error detection uh, let us look at uh, uh, let us say we are using a wireless link which has lot of errors. Now, if you are not doing error detection and correcting it through some uh, ARQ mechanism you are now putting this burden on the application layer which by the way. Uh, this packets may have traversed many hops over multiple links uh, to reach the other destination. So, if you are not correcting at the link layer then the burden comes on the application layer and that becomes a very big burden which will lead to lot more delay or increase in your response time. Uh, so, the contrast so the trade off is if you are doing at the higher layers it is good because you are uh, taking care of lot of errors, but if you push everything there your response time or the delay is going to be significantly higher. So, you should use your judgment in deciding where you want to apply functionality. So, when it comes to error detection if you are very confident that your link the chances of it corrupting your packets because you are using a fiber optics link you do not have to do error detection at the link layer because the link is very reliable. Uh, whatever uh, uh, errors that creep in you can handle it at some of the higher layers. But on the other hand if you are using a wireless link which can corrupt packets significantly you may want to do error detection uh, at the link layer because uh, if you quickly uh, correct there your response time is going to be much better. So, those are some of the uh, reasons that go into deciding where you want to implement certain functionality. A uh, lot of this uh, error detection and recovery happens at the transport layer because many applications want that feature. So, if you instead of telling I will put the burden of doing this on each and every application it makes sense for you to implement it in a common place that is the layering concept and let each applications um, use this. In the hope that the number of errors that will creep in beyond this is uh, minimal but you may always want to check at the application layer the integrity of your data. So, for example, if you are transferring a file you may want to do a, a hash of the file at the end to check that uh, indeed the file I received is the same as the file that was sent. So, most applications do this as well, but the burden of recovering from errors is on the transport layer because many applications need that functionality. Now, coming to error correction uh, the question is when do you do error detection when do you do error correction. So, for that ok again this is a function of uh, what the error rates are. So, typically what happens is this is your link and let us say you have 50 percent loss rate. 
okay. In this type of cases where the error rates are very high, correction makes sense because almost every packet, every other packet there will be some errors. So, you might as well correct those errors instead of if you were doing error detection, what would happen is you send a packet, this guy will detect that the packet is in error, then it will send a saying see the packet is in error that let me call it as a NAC then this guy is going to retransmit the packet let me call d1 d1 again it is going to retransmit. So, this results in a round trip time. For cases where you do not want to incur this overhead and when typically that cases happen when the loss rates are high you want to do error correction. In fact, there is a problem as part of the Bodhi tree that in fact gives a trade off between what error rate uh, one will do better than the other. So, I would uh, if whoever is interested in understanding this I would ask them to work out that problem to get um, more information on when does it make sense to do error correction versus error detection. Um, this question was asked by center 1314 as well as 1085 as well as 1295. Okay. Uh, moving on, so another question that was asked um, I think by center 1107 is how is performance improved in CSMA CD compared to CSMA. So, CSMA is just carrier sense multiple access all that is telling is before you transmit you sense the channel if you find there is a carrier which means energy then you refrain from transmitting. Contrasting this with CSMA CD where it is adding this additional feature called collision detection which is saying that you also try to detect if there is a collision. Now, why is this better than CSMA? So, what happens if you were to employ just CSMA? is you are careful. So, when you before you transmit you are sensing the channel let us say you did not find uh, any transmission and you sent your frame. So, this is the frame, but because of reasons other reasons it is very much conceivable, but someone else also sends the channel at the same time as you or even slightly off. Um, if this was within the round trip time I again went into a lot of detail in the videos. Uh, it is possible that you may not have received the trans the earlier transmission. So, you may still have sensed the channel idle and transmitted. So, this is going to result in a collision. Now, if you had collision detection you would have detected the collision somewhere here and stopped the transmission. This portion on which I am showing in this particular fashion is not going to be wasted anymore in CSMA CD whereas, if you just did CSMA CA if your frame is really long you may continue to transmit for a really long time only here you would stop and then uh, access the channel whereas, in collision detection you would have stopped right here. So, this wastage is prevented in collision detection if you employ collision detection. So, this is uh, remote center 1107. Okay. Another common question that was asked again by multiple centers is uh, can we assign anyone's IP to our own MAC address. Uh, basically, this is called uh, ARP spoofing. So, how does one tackle this kind of ARP spoofing? So, as I mentioned ARP is basically uh, a protocol where if someone says what is the MAC address corresponding to this particular IP address you get the MAC address and thereby receive the packet. Now, in ARP spoofing what happens is the following. So, in ARP spoofing so there is this host let me call host 1 whose IP address is H 1 and MAC address is H 1. Now, there is this other host 2 which is a malicious host what it is trying to do is capture packets corresponding to uh, host 1. So, what it will do is it has a different MAC, but it is going to assign itself the same IP address as host 1. 
So whenever a request comes that says what is the MAC address corresponding to IP host 1, this host somehow I won't get into the details of how is going to tell that this corresponds to MAC H2 and thereby capture packets corresponding to host 1. Uh, for example, you could do this by uh, launching a denial of service attack on this, bringing this host 1 and then using gratuitous art broadcast this so that others will start to contact you. Um, there are many ways to uh, do this, um, but let us just focus on how, so this is called ARP spoofing. So how does one go about detecting such ARP spoofing and correcting this particular uh, uh, mechanism? So there are multiple ways, lot of these switches the ethernet switches which you use do come with uh, try with uh, features to detect that kind of arc spoofing. So basically any switch uh, which has multiple ports, so this host 1 may be on port 1, port 0 and host 2 may be on port 1 and if it sees arc from here as well as here and uh, figure out that uh, both are advertising, they are different uh, MAC addresses but both have the same IP address, it is then going to raise a flag and send an email to the network administrator saying that uh, something like this is happening. So lot of the switches do monitor this kind of information, but um, a malicious user who is really intent on ARP spoofing can for example launch, launch this denial of service attack, uh, bring down host 1 and do something like this. So it is in general uh, difficult to prevent some of these. The best way to overcome some of these things is employ security at the highest level. By which I mean this guy is trying to capture packets of host 1 basically from some server. So the server has to have some cryptographic techniques where it has to identify that it is indeed host 1 that is accessing my packets and not uh, someone else by insisting that uh, for example through a password username mechanisms or some cryptographic keys that are exchanged between them and thereby uh, take the help of these switches also to ensure that uh, this is happening. By the way, this is a bit more complicated topic, it falls under security. I do not want to get into too many details, but at a high level this is how things are currently. You need to address uh, things at a higher layer in terms of security. Uh, this question has uh, come from 1, 2, 2, 2. So another question which uh, what is the relationship between bandwidth and transition when you are doing encoding? Uh, this has come from remote center 1196. So let us look at NRZ encoding. So in NRZ encoding you have this uh, ones and zeros represented uh, in this particular fashion uh, where you have a sequence of ones and zeros. This is, uh, this is being sent at a specific rate, typically when we say something is being sent at 1 megabits per second, it basically means in a duration of 1 second there are uh, 1 million bits. So this is the data rate. I also mentioned that this uh, signal has a corresponding bandwidth. So if you look at the bandwidth corresponding to this signal, it will be something like this. So in fact it will have infinite bandwidth that is going on and on, but most of the power is concentrated here. So this will be a function of 1 over f which is uh, the rate at which the transitions are happening. So if you see here if this is 1 megabits per second, this will be about 1 megahertz. Okay. Now when you are doing encoding in uh, the computer networks, you since you use NRZ, this is the kind of relation that you have. But often this is a very primitive encoding, there are lot more sophisticated encoding mechanisms like uh, you could do BPSK, QPSK, QAM, uh, so on and so forth. What they do is they try to pack more bits into something called a symbol 
and it is going to occupy. Um, uh, so, for example, if you went for an encoding like uh, let me call 64 QAM, even though your data rate is 1 Mbps, the amount of bandwidth that you are going to occupy is uh, 1 over 3 megahertz. So, you are doing better in that particular case. Uh, that is to do with how the kind of modulation you are doing so on so forth. So, typically a rule of thumb especially when you deal with binary sequences at a specific rate like this is the amount of bandwidth that you occupy roughly if you are using 2 Mbps it will be 2 megahertz, 10 Mbps, 10 megahertz. But this kind of encoding is not very spectrally efficient. There are lot more sophisticated encoding techniques that are really good in terms of spectrum efficiency. So, you would achieve something like, uh, uh, so you will occupy bandwidth that is one third, one fourth, one fifth of the data rate depending upon the type of encoding you are using. This is 1196. Uh, another question since there is some more time. So, this was asked by remote center 1150, what is the difference between layer 2 switch and layer 3 switch. So, switching as a concept is a case where you have a device, it has some input lines, it has output lines. Switching is about moving the packets that come on some input lines to some output lines determining uh, which output lines to send them to. So, that is the basic concept of switching. Now, the switching is applicable at the link layer as well as the network layer. The difference often is one very simple way to characterize it is what header are you looking at. So, the link layer switches will look at the link layer headers and the network layer switches will look at the network layer headers which is typically the IP header. Um, the link layer switches for example, ethernet will look at the ethernet headers to figure out how to switch. So, that is more or less the uh, very simple way of saying uh, the protocols employed are also very different. For example, ethernet switches uh, will use some spanning tree protocols and so on whereas, at the um, network layer they use routing protocols like uh, uh, RIP or OSPF, BGP so on so forth. Uh, so, the functionality is taking packets from an input line and sending out on some other output line, but which layer are you operating on and according to that layer the header values will be different and the kind of mechanisms you employ is also going to be different. So, this is uh, 1150. Okay. Uh, I do not remember which remote center sometime back they asked uh, between CRC some uh, longitudinal uh, redundancy check, vertical horizontal redundancy check so on so forth what is used where. So, there are all kinds of, uh, so all these are error detection algorithms, there are all kinds of error detection algorithms that are employed in different settings. Uh, for example, some are employed in telecommunication network, some are employed uh, in uh, when you are writing to a hard disk, some are employed when you are reading from uh, the DVDs, uh, some are employed in the internet so on so forth. So, the kind of things that are employed in the internet are typically the cyclic redundancy check which is the CRC um, at the link layer. Naturally, if you are using wireless there are more sophisticated uh, detection as well as correction techniques that are employed error correction you could use convolution codes, turbo codes blah blah. Um, at the network layer there is the concept of uh, internet checksum, at the transport layer also there is a checksum which is based on internet checksum. Uh, so, it is a function of uh, using the right approach in the right setting, certain things are better. So, for example, in the internet checksum you do not use CRC because you just want something very lightweight. Uh, that will run very fast on the routers um, and the internet checksum and the loss rates are not so high. So, uh, internet checksum suffices. Whereas, at the link layer uh, you want a little bit more reliability especially if it is a wireless thing. 
So, you want something with better error uh, detection capabilities, so you go for CRC. So, it is totally based on the context. Okay. So, we will do one last question. So, one question that was asked is in Aloha scheme, when did the sender know the status of the packet either after each packet transmission or at the end of the whole transmission. So, in Aloha you actually transmit only one packet at a time. So, you transmit the packet and you expect that the acknowledgement comes right after it. So, you do get to know the status of this packet right after the packet transmission. So, this was from remote center 1013. So, it is uh, 1 o'clock, I think we should break for lunch.